Well, hello, my name is Diana Lindsay, and welcome to another Sunbelt Spotlight, where we feature some of our authors and their, and their books. Today, we have a very, very special presentation by uh, Professor Iris Engstrand. Uh, she is the author of our book, award-winning book, San Diego, California's Cornerstone. She's a recently retired uh, professor of history from the University of San Diego and where she was recognized and honored as a distinguished university uh, professorship and the Davies, and she received the Davies Award for Faculty Achievement. These are only a couple of the numerous awards that she has uh, received in her lifetime of studying history. Uh, she, is a, she has traveled widely uh, and she lectures both in Spanish and English. Uh, she has degrees in history and majors and minors in fields of California history, Mexico, Latin America, and the Spanish Southwest. Uh, she is also a co-editor of the Journal of San Diego History. Uh, she's a, been a trustee of the San Diego Natural History Museum, the Maritime Museum, and the History Center. Uh, we're just delighted to have her. She's the author of over 25 different books. Uh, that, that possibly you have seen, and hopefully uh, you'll take a look at the one that Sunbelt has produced on the, on the history of the local San Diego area. We're delighted today because it's a special day. It's September 16th. It is the Independence Day for Mexico, and Iris will be speaking about the history of the Mexican independence, which began on the 16th of September in 1812. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Iris Engstrand. Well, good afternoon. I see that uh, we have some listeners here that are interested in Mexican independence. I'm sure that there were a number of people who probably looked at their iPhone today and it said Independence Day. And they thought, Independence Day, isn't that July 4th? Well, for California, our first Independence Day was celebrated when we were under Mexico. So since it's Mexican independence, that's why we can actually take the day off. In fact, the Mexicans can really start last night at about midnight because the first act of independence was when uh, Miguel Hidalgo, a parish priest, decided that it was time to get free of the Spaniards. And so he enlisted a number of people, including a Captain Ignacio Allende, to shout the Grito de Dolores is what they call the cry of Dolores, which was Mexican, long live Mexico, death to the Gachupines. Well, Gachupin was the word for Spaniard, and so they wanted to become independent from Spain. And they went around releasing Mexican prisoners from the jails and also letting out uh, quite a few Mexicans that had been uh, incarcerated. And so they began the Mexican independence a little after midnight on September 16th, actually very much in the morning. They had an army of about 20,000 Indians that they had gathered together. And so they began to father, follow Father Hidalgo and uh, Miguel Allende uh, on a trek to Mexico City to unseat the Viceroy. Unfortunately, they weren't very well organized and it was a pretty ragtag army. Although some of you may know the town of San Miguel Allende, it used to be San Miguel El Grande, and that's where Allende was from, and so it's been renamed. Well, anyway, they did not do very well and were captured, and Miguel Hidalgo was captured just the next year and was executed. So that was a very sad beginning. However, a couple of years later, another priest, Jose Morelos, uh, took over Hidalgo's uh, role as the leader. And so he put together another army and they started marching from Querétaro on to Mexico City. But again, being poorly organized and underfunded, uh, they were captured and Jose Maria Morelos was uh, executed So in 1815. So they had two false starts. And although there's a lot of towns named Hidalgo and uh, the state of Morelia is named for Morelos, so lots of place names, but that was about it for their success. And finally, toward the end of the decade, one of the Spanish soldiers, 
Augustine Iturbide decided to, to defect from Spain and join the Mexicans. So he, along with quite a few other uh, Mexican generals that were kind of waiting in the wings, uh, they carried out a plan. Uh, it was the plan of Iguala, or Iguala, and they said it was the army of three guarantees. They were going to guarantee independence from Spain, and they were going to guarantee that all people could become citizens, whether you're an Indian or mestizo or what, and uh, equality for all, and they would all be uh, adhering to this Catholic faith. So the religion it was actually foremost in this uh, independence movement, and that's why Mexico, Mexico is still fairly Catholic today. There are, of course, exceptions, but that was one of the provisions. Well, Ito Bide, although he promised a lot of changes, he somehow fell back into his dictatorial ways that he'd had before and called himself Augustine the First. And so many of the Mexicans said, hey, wait a minute, we didn't ask for, he wanted to be Emperor Augustine the First. They said, well, we weren't asking for that. And so they captured him and exiled him. But somehow in 1824, he thought a number of Mexicans were calling him back. So he returned to Spain, pardon me, returned to Mexico. And as soon as they saw him, they said, hey, you know, we exiled you. So they captured him and he was executed. So that was the end of his short term. So Mexico goes on. And by 1824, there were some uh, men, Vicente Guerrero and some others who uh, took over and Mexico had a fairly, you know, pretty easy time after that for the next quite a few years. So all of this has a lot to do with California because uh, we were under Spain. I mean, first we were under Spain and then we were under Mexico after this Mexican war. Well, we had uh, exiled the Spanish, the last Spanish governor of California, Pablo de Sola, and had put in a native born person, Luis Antonio Arguello, who was from the very popular Arguello family. In fact, in San Diego, there were quite a few Arguellos living here, and in fact, they're still descendants. So he became the uh, governor of California. He was the first native born governor and uh, they adopted a constitution in 1824 in Mexico and so we were now a Mexican province. However, Arguello was soon replaced by a man from Mexico City, Jose Maria Echandia, who became the governor of both Californias, Upper California and Lower California. At that time it was Antigua and Nueva. California, old and new California. Eventually, as you know, we started calling it Lower and Upper California, and that's where we get the name of Baja California, uh, that we still refer to it as today. Well, Echandia uh, was governor of both provinces, so he moved the capital from Monterey, where it had been since the Spanish conquest and where the even uh, the governors had all lived. He moved him to San Diego because San Diego would be midway between Baja California and uh, Upper California. Well, there's a lot of good stories in San Diego history about Jose Maria Echandia. And one of the uh, most famous one is that he fell in love with one of the local girls of the uh, Carrillo family and uh, wanted to marry her, Josefa. But she she thought he was too old and, and too stuffy and, and she didn't want to marry him. And so, but her father insisted and he said, we're not only going to marry him, we're going to have a big party celebrating your engagement. So they had the party, but when it was over, she talked to her cousin Pio Pico and said, you know, I met this uh, lieutenant at the party and I would rather marry him. We got to be pretty friendly. And they said, well, you're supposed to marry the governor. She says, oh, no way. He's too old. And so Pio Pico helped her escape that night. 
and she went down, he took her down to the harbor and she got on board this American captain's uh, ship and his name was Henry Delano Fitch. And so he sails away with her and it causes a giant scandal in, in uh, Mexican San Diego and especially with the governor. But he, they were gone for a year and of course it's a very romantic story. Uh, she comes back a year later with a baby in her arms and Captain Fitch, but H. Yandia still hasn't gotten over it. So he arrests Fitch and sends him to San Gabriel for trial. Well, the trial found him innocent. And because a priest had come forward and said, actually, she didn't run off not being married because on the shore before they left, when Pio Pico took her there, they found a priest who married him. So she was then officially married. And so her father had to forgive her and now she had a baby and all was well. But the penance for Fitch was that he had to provide a bell for the church in Los Angeles, the, uh, the Catholic church there, which the bell, I guess, still exists there. So there is a play about it, an opera uh, called My Cousin Josefa. So for San Diego, that was pretty exciting. Uh, well, during the Mexican period, things did change a lot. And one of the main things was the secularization of the missions. So most people really don't have a good understanding that it was under the Mexican government that the Franciscans gave up the missions, left, never took any of the land. They were not allowed to own land. So the Franciscan priests were all... Uh, expelled and the missions turned into either parish churches or were just abandoned or some of them were actually even used as uh, churches by the the Mexicans that were still here and so it would be nice sometime if we could get all of the the history of what happened to the Franciscans together and uh, they had to leave and, and went back to their either their native land or went down to Mexico or to other other churches. Well, this is the period in San Diego history of the ranchos. And again, most people don't realize under Spain, we only had 20 ranchos granted, very large ranchos and a lot of land. But under Mexico, we had, we're still counting between 600 and 800 ranchos. So that's why the government of Mexico is way more generous. Of course, they granted to private citizens a lot of the mission lands. They were called, and even San Diego itself and our University of San Diego, if you look at your deed or your title, it might say X Mission San Diego land, the first owners, or it might have just been Pueblo lands. So we were a Pueblo in, under Mexico in 1834. So California or sort of Mexican uh, influence here is very great and we have quite a large Mexican population. So I think it's really only fitting that we're uh, celebrating Mexican independence uh, in San Diego today, uh, September 16th, and they'll be celebrating it in other parts of Mexico. And a, a reason that we've kind of been celebrating it and making it known to everybody is people for a while, and not the Mexicans, of course, but a lot of Americans thought Cinco de Mayo somehow was Mexican independence because that was the only holiday they could imagine that people would be celebrating here. But that's still a good celebration, but it, it's not, it's a battle in Puebla, whereas Mexican independence is today, of course, September 16th. So if Perhaps, uh, Diana, do you have any questions? Do you think I can clear something up? Uh, here's a quick question, Iris, for you. Um, what does San Diego do to celebrate the 16th? Are there any uh, types of events or festivals that you know of? No, I don't really know of anything particular in Old Town and the restaurants. And I think they now understand that September 16th is Mexican independence and they're having some special food but now the problem is the pandemic of course and so what we've had in previous years they're not having this year because you can't have any gathering in former years and i'm hoping of course next year that we'll be able to put something together a little more meaningful than we're we're kind of stuck right now this year
the Fitch family has gone on. I mean, they're they're quite numerous in Tijuana and in uh, San Diego. And in fact, a lot of the families from those early days, and there was a lot of intermarriage. A lot of the Americans who came to San Diego, who came, uh, were granted ranches. Jose Warner, Warner Springs, and and uh, up in that region. So there was uh, in the Dominguez family and William Hartnell or some mix of Joseph Chapman. And my master's thesis person, William Wolfskill, married into the Lugo family. So the the era from in the Mexican period was one of a lot of intermarriage. And there was intermarriage in the Mexican families because their families numbered about eight to 10 children. And it was not very many people lived in California. It was it's very sparsely populated. So ranchos, the minimum rancho that you could get was 17,000 acres. And some of the Americans, they said, well, you know, we just don't want that much land. Can't we take less? And so can you imagine today saying, hey, I don't want all that land. I'll just take, you know, a little part. But uh, those days are gone forever, that's for sure. Um, I, Iris, uh, another uh, quick question. How long did it take for the folks in San Diego to learn about the independence that was starting in Mexico? What was the delay in time? Well, the, the delay in time was mostly by just the distance. And the, the first really inclination they got was they were attacked by this uh, kind of a pirate from Argentina, Hippolito, Hippolito Bouchard in 1818 and he came in from Hawaii actually he had picked up another ship there and was originally from Argentina and attacked Monterey so that was the first time they'd even heard of independence and they weren't ready obviously but they managed to um, chase him out and he came down past San Diego and then landed at San Juan Capistrano so the story goes that these kind of revolutionary pirate people went to the San, uh, the, the mission at uh, San Juan Capistrano and stole a whole bunch of wine. And then when they went back to the shore to get on the ships, they all drank the wine and were drunk. And so the, the Spanish, the Mexican soldiers were able to defeat them. And so they left it. It, it makes a good story too, uh, what was going on. So you never know these days. Yeah, and then how about how did the uh, the people in San Diego react? Did they were they favorable to independence, or were they uh, was there any reaction negative, or what was the overall reaction? They didn't really care because Spain had not given them any. They're back. They were back on their salary. They hadn't really sent supply ships since 1810, and uh, Spain in Mexico and they had so much land that they were underpopulated but and to them California was really not very economically profitable because they didn't know about the gold rush so the only thing that was going on here was cattle ranching and that just takes a lot of work and so it wasn't that California was any particular gem for them to come and, and settle in fact they they had to bribe people to come and settle they to Los Angeles when it was first founded, they promised people land and cattle and sheep and chickens and whatever, and they had wages of a sailor for a year, just if they'd come and settle here. Boy, somebody, some people sure didn't take advantage of a good thing. Yeah, no lie. <laughs> well, unless anybody has another question that I think we pretty well covered it and people will remember that uh, it is today, September 16th, and I think some people started last night, at, right after midnight, so they're probably getting a little tired right now. Well, Iris, I have a quick question. It has nothing to do with this because I noticed on your bio, and I, I'm very curious about it. You received an award, the Order of Isabel La Catolica, from the uh, King Juan Carlos of Spain for outstanding contributions to the history of of uh, Spain in America. T tell us a little bit about this award. It really sounds very intriguing. Well, it's a really very special award and it's only given to people outside of Spain. Only foreigners can, and it was started way back in the 1800s uh, to reward some people in America who were 
talking about the history of Spain because after the New World was settled and it, you know South America and North America came, people kind of kept forgetting about the roots, the the Spaniards who actually first came, and so like. I talk about my dissertations on Spanish scientists, naturalists who came. And other people, of course, have written about the missionaries who all originated in Spain. And so in order to give recognition to scholars in outside of uh, Spain who were writing about Spanish history, they adopted this award. So only, you know, they just give about one or maybe two a year since, you know, for the past 20 or oh, I think allegedly since the 1800s, but who knows, but it's, it's quite an honor. And usually an ambassador from Spain gives it to you. And it's, uh, I've been, I did work in Spain doing research for quite a few years and was able to be at some gatherings where uh, Juan Carlos was, but I don't think he, he noticed me particularly. <laughs> and, uh, but I've done some work with TV Española and it's, it's been a good relationship. And I think it's important for people to understand quite a bit more about the history of here in San Diego, our Spanish period and our Rancho period, the difference between Spain and Mexico. You now, a lot of people will say to me, oh, is that why we have all these Spanish names? Or they'll say, how come we have so many streets with Spanish names? Well, we were under Spain, discovered for quite a few years and then continued on with Mexico. My only complaint about that is I, I wish they'd get them right. I think sometimes people don't check with a Spanish speaking person and we have some pretty odd names that are allegedly Spanish. Great, well, you certainly have had a flock of awards and you've deserved all of them for all your great research worldwide and, and your contributions to San Diego history. So it's, you know, it's truly a delight to have you on, on our Sunbelt Spotlight today. Well, thank you for having me. And I said, if you want to get more interest, uh, more details about San Diego history, the book you mentioned, my book, San Diego, California's Cornerstone, uh, it starts with prehistory with the Indians and goes all the way to 2015. So you can catch up. You know, one of the things I really like about that book is the timeline in the back. If you're if you're in a hurry and you just want to catch an overall view of San Diego history, you can flip through the timeline and really get a good feel for the for the history here. And I think that was a tremendous contribution to the book. Well, thank you. I, it helps me. And when I was teaching California history, that I, even the students had said, "If you don't want to read the book, just look at the timeline." <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Well, thank you, Iris. All right, we'll see you soon. Okay.